gospel is that there is this infinite, almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful creator God that created all things for his glory. And you and I have belittled that, belittled his name, belittled his glory. Every one of us have at one time or another, or actually currently, believe that our way is better than God's. We fail to acknowledge, give him glory for the gifts he's given us. We question his rule and his authority while at the same time doing that with the brain he gave us and holds together and the lungs and the air that he gave us to breathe with. This is the great blasphemy of the universe. So we've all belittled God and God being just right and holy is not going to allow the belittlement of his name. God then, not being able to spare wrath, sends Christ in the flesh and crushes him. And in so doing, pours out his wrath against the children of God onto the Son, killing him. Then God raises him from the dead. And that same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work in those who would believe. This is the gospel. That you and I have right standing before God, not by our efforts, not by our works, not by our skill, not by whether or not we cuss or don't cuss, drink or don't drink, watch this, don't watch this, do this, don't do that. Justified before God by the cross of Christ alone. Your lust, you're not going to be able to fix it. Your bitterness, you're not going to be able to fix it. Your rage, anger, those deviances that have been following you around, you don't possess the power of life and death. You can't resurrect anything. Christ can. That's the good news. That's why we don't celebrate us. That's why we continually celebrate him. We boast in the cross and the cross alone, the same power that is at work in raising Christ from the dead is at work in me and work in all who believe. This is the gospel. Amen. I think we can invite the worship team back up, right? That's, that's a good message. So I, I, it's the simplicity of the gospel. I think sometimes we make it so difficult, and we make it about this and that, and where Seth left us last week was a man hanging on a cross by two criminals. And we walked out from the service last week was, oh. And, and Pastor Kathy, people were just going like, oh, that just felt so hopeless. See, what happened on that day at Calvary, when Jesus breathed his last breath, the devil thought he won. See, the devil thought that he had defeated God. But what Jesus did on the cross, he sucker punched Satan. Satan. He sucker punched Satan with two sticks and three nails. And when he died and took his last breath, Jesus descended into hell and defeated Satan and nailed it back on the cross and said, paid in full. The moment, amen. See, one of the things about being a pastor is when you preach the resurrection story, you're like, yes. But the other thing, oh no. How do I preach the resurrection story that is going to keep you captivated? See, some of you have heard so much of the story, you have lost the power of the story. And, and, and you know, one of the nicknames I hear that people call me, they call me the prop pastor now. So how do you come up with a prop that outdoes what Jesus did in a tomb 2,000 years ago, that he is alive? And, and it started, you know, because this is the classic Easter message. This is, every pastor wrestles with this. How do I overcome this message and make it as good as last year, if not better? But what I love is how Jesus dealt with large crowds. So right now, we probably have 700 people in this room. Pretty large crowd. And it says in Luke 8, it says, 
large crowd gathered around Jesus. It said from town to town, they all came around. And I just want you to picture Jesus sitting on a hill and, and they come around and they have heard about Jesus and he had healed the sick and cast out demons and he's even multiplied food, right? If Jesus was here and he was out at, Can at uh, Canyon View Park, would you not go? Right? And so he's there and everybody's like, oh, I can't wait to hear what Jesus has to say. And so, so Jesus, all this crowd's gathering around. They're kind of pushing, trying to get their best seats and stuff, and their scalpers and all the other stuff. And, um, and Jesus says, hey, there's this farmer. I'm like, what? And he says, you know, that there's this farmer. He goes around casting seeds. And there's these four different soils. And he says, he reaches into his bag, and, you know, I'm totally paraphrasing Luke 8, but you guys get the story. If you've been in church for a while, you know the story, right? And he says, he goes, and he casts some seeds, and he, he throws some seeds, in, and he plants it in the soil, and, and he says, all of a sudden, this bird comes along. Eh. <laughs> and he eats. Now, see, Jesus didn't have props. So he has this prop, and he, and he eats the seeds. And he says, oh, but I want to tell you about another soil. And he, and he comes around and goes, oh, look at these rocks. He says, and he threw some seeds on these rocks. Just two, two, two. He says, and they started to sprout, but they withered because of the lack of moisture. I'm like, wow, that's a dumb farmer. And then he found, oh, this looks like a good place that seeds would grow, right? And he plants seeds there, but it says his seeds took hold and they started to grow among these other weeds. See, we know the story so well, we know what it means, right? But I want you to think about what it was like for them to be sitting and hearing this. Hey, Jesus, when are we going to get the healing stuff? When are we going to get to feeding thousands? When are we going to get to casting out demons? And then he says, and then there's this other soil. And he says he planted it, and it produced a hundredfold. And then everybody's like, okay. And then he says, hey, you with ears, here. Goodbye. And he walked away. And you're thinking, is that it, Jesus? And what he was doing, he's saying that whenever there's a gathering, there is going to be different soils. And as a pastor, we want every soil to produce a hundredfold. But I know as I share the word of God, there is a devil out there who's going to try to steal the seed. And then there are some of you that your heart is so hardened to the gospel, you're like, I don't even know I'm here. And you're probably checking your cell phone right now. And that even if you gathered something of it, if you don't water it, it will die. And then some of you, and I'm telling you, this has been my walk for years. I seem to go between these two soils. I allow things of this world to choke me out. I hear the news. I think this. I want that or this, that. And, and, and I take the seed and the Bible calls it the incorruptible seed of God. But it seems the only thing that can corrupt the seed of God is the weeds that I allow it. The, I, that's good preaching, Bob. Okay, the only thing <laughs> that can corrupt the seed of God is the weeds that I allow it. And, and, and it chokes it out. And so what I do is I hear the word of God. I come to a, a sermon and I hear Pastor Kirk share the truth of God or I go to a cell group meeting and I hear my cell group leader share the word of God. And I said, boy, I ought to do something with that. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put it in my wallet. And then I'll deal with it later. You know, I'll deal with it after I'm done with my job, after I'm done with school, after I, and you just feel whatever after you want to. And it's easy to say, well, that's weeds, but I put it in there and it dies. It dies. And my prayer today, listen, is my prayer is that Jesus defeated this guy 
2,000 years ago, descended into hell, bound him up, dragged him around, and nailed it to that beam there and says, it is done. He has no business stealing the truth from you guys today. And, and for you who have hard hearts, you have a decision today. God, soften my heart. Teal my heart. Make it fresh. Make it be the soil that produces life. Because some of us come in here with so much pain and so much disappointment and so much that it is, this is your soil. And God wants to produce life in this. If God can make water come out of a rock, he can make your heart and replace it with a heart of flesh. Every one of us who have life in their thing, they produce a hundredfold, have a time in their life where this was their story. Every one of us. So I'm not judging. I'm just saying, if that's you, ask the Lord to till your heart. Amen? So what we need to do is we need to pray, because only God can do this. Amen? So, uh, Father, we just come before and we say, Holy Spirit, make this the most incredible day that happened 2,000 years ago with the tomb being empty. That they screamed, he has risen. He has risen indeed. Lord, prepare our hearts today that it's just not a story that we've heard so many times. That we are his fruit. And in him, we have life. We have resurrected life. In him, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in all who say yes to him. So, Lord, I just pray right now that you would turn hearts that soils that would produce a hundredfold. And all God's people said, amen. amen. So, last week, we ended with Jesus left on the cross, and, and then um, we're going to pick up with the story right now, and we're going to do it in video form, kind of picking up exactly where we left off. So, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it. If we are starting in John 19, and we'll jump into John 20. So let's take a look. The two men took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen cloths with the spices, according to the Jewish custom of preparing a body for burial. There was a garden in the place where Jesus had been put to death, and in it there was a new tomb where no one had ever been buried. Since it was the day before the Sabbath, and because the tomb was close by, they placed Jesus' body there. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been taken away from the entrance. She went running to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord from the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciple went to the tomb. The two of them were running, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and saw the linen cloths, but he did not go in. Behind him came Simon Peter, and he went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the cloth which had been around Jesus' head. It was not lying with the linen cloths, but was rolled up by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. They still did not understand the scripture, which said that he must rise from death. Then the disciples went back home. Mary stood crying outside the tomb. What I love about the story, John writes this, and he says how he beat Peter to the tomb. I'm like, eh, that's such a guy thing. That is such a... The only thing that was missing was, and Peter was out of breath. And... Uh, 
But I want to really focus on uh, of two verses right here, and it's John uh, 28 and uh, 20, verse 8 and 9. And it says, when the other disciple who reached the tomb first, see, I won again. He says it twice. Also went in, he saw and believed, and yet did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Is that sometimes we need to see to believe, right? Sometimes the, the, the power of the resurrection is seeing lives who have been changed. Amen? Is that if, if we don't see radical lives changed, then is it just a story? I, I'll, I'll never forget one of the bad things about, um, or I shouldn't say bad, one of the hard things about being a pastor is that you get to walk people through the last stages of life. And I've been in the room many a times at hospice and at bedsides where people take their last breath. And I remember one time I was in this room and it was at the hospital and this lady just, so I just need Pastor Bob to be here. And so um, when I got there, she had very shallow breath, and it was ending. And next to her was her husband, her teenage daughter, her mother, her brother, and some friends. And they were all talking among themselves, to, you, know, you know, she's going to be reincarnated. Now, this, the, the family's not believers, they're like, oh, when she gets reincarnated or she's going to go to heaven, she just loves the Raiders. I'm like, well, maybe she's not going to heaven. No, I'm um, so. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so, um, but they're, they're like, oh, she's going to love, you know, she's going to be cheering for me. I'm like, you guys don't understand anything. And then as she took her last breath, there was just this sadness that came in the room. And I heard the Holy Spirit whisper to me. And as they put the sheet over her head, just like we saw in Jesus' tomb, why do you look for the living among the dead? And this peace just came over me because I knew she was alive because he died and he lived, and because he lives, we live. Amen. And what I love is that this is what Jesus, it says, but they did not understand the scripture, and this is what Jesus told them. In Matthew 20, verse 17 through 19, so Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. I just want you to picture him and the 12, the boys, they're coming in. And Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 aside and he said to them, see, uh, he, Jesus couldn't have been more clear on this one. This is no more parables. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like a treasure found in the field. The kingdom, he's like, all right, guys, come here. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen this week. He says, see, we are going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, I, will be delivered over to the chief priest. You know those guys in the black robes? And scribes, and they will condemn him, me, to death. Now, could Jesus have been any clearer? What is going to happen? I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be condemned to death. And not only... I'm going to be delivered over to them and to the Gentiles to be mocked, to be flogged and crucified. And he will raise on the third day. And yet, when John walks into the tomb, he believes, but he does not understand. I am so glad they put that in there. Because I don't know about you, I read the scriptures, I believe, but I don't always understand. I don't always understand why God says to lay hands on the sick and they will recover and they don't always. I don't understand 
why he says, if I lift up the name of Jesus, people will be drawn. And yet sometimes I'm made fun of and they run away. But I believe. I believe because he says so. And he will rise on the third day. See, what happened here on the cross is this, it's called the great exchange. See, Jesus dealt with our sin and our death. We were dead. We were dead in our trespasses. And when Jesus died on the cross, he did this great exchange. He took his righteousness for our unrighteousness and said, let's make a deal. You guys remember that the TV show? Let's make a deal. I will give you every wealth there is for what's in your wallet. Do you want to make a deal? That's what Jesus did that day. And, and he says, when he died, that he says, we will also die with him. It says in Romans 6, 5, it says, for we have been united with him in his death like his, and we shall certainly be united with him in his resurrection like him. The only way that we can come to know Jesus is that we must die to our self. We must repent. Jesus says, unless a kernel falls to the ground and dies, it cannot reproduce. And then he says, you must, listen, he says, if you love your life, you will lose it. But if you hate your life, you will have eternal life. You must die to yourself as Christ died on the cross. I'm telling you, people say, oh, it's so easy to come to Jesus. That is true. But this flesh thing is really hard. Am I preaching to anybody out there? Because it, this flesh thing keeps rising up. And so we must die daily. We must die daily to this. But one of the things that, that we don't understand, we understand that Jesus died on a cross. I want you to see, this is love. No greater love than to someone to lay down their life. That Jesus so loved the world that he died for us. And in dying that we would have life. But what people don't understand, when he died, what happened? They wrapped him in tomb. They brought him into the, the tomb. And when he was dead, it says the scriptures say that he descended. Ephesians 4 says that when he ascended on high, he was led a host of captives. And he gave them the gifts to men. So which is saying is that, that he is ascended, also descended to the lower region. When Jesus died, he went down into the lower regions, hell, or Gehenna, and he preached the gospel to set the captives free. It says in 1 Peter 1, uh, uh, 3, 18 and 19, and I'm just going to read the last part. It says that in which he went to proclaim to, to the spirits in prison. See, Jesus' Jesus's mission, one of his missions were to proclaim liberty to those who were in prison and to set the captives free. Prisoners and captives. Can you kind of picture in your head? What's the difference? What's the difference between a prisoner and a captive? It used to puzzle me for the longest time. But a prisoner, you have been tried and convicted and you're in jail. You deserve it. The only way you are getting out of prison is if the governor does what? Pardon you. Right? Right? There is no other way. There's no other escape. You can only get out if Governor Hickenlooper says, I am going to let Bob Clifford out. And that is what happened on the cross. He not only paid for your sin, but he paid for all sin. We were condemned to death. And Jesus came and handed us a pardon to those who were in prison. But it says he proclaimed to set the captives free. Captives, I want you to think POW. Can you picture POW? What does it take to be a POW? It means you're doing your job, you're a soldier, and you have been captive. This guy 
You're a Christian, and this guy comes in there, and he puts hopelessness on you. He puts depression on you. He puts discouragement on you. He puts all this, and you are captive. And Jesus went down to those who are and proclaimed liberty to them. The same guy who died on this cross in this tomb set the captive free to those who are in P&W. It should not be that way for those who are in Christ. And I'm not saying we don't have seasons because this guy is like a roaring lion waiting to devour us. And even though he has been defeated and his time is coming and he will be thrown into the lake of hell, right now he just can scare us and he puts thoughts in our minds that gives us no hope. But I tell you today, if that is you, if that is you, I am hopeless. Jesus comes to make it fruitful. And we come to him to say, set me free. Set me free. Nothing is impossible. And the tomb proves it. Because it says in the resurrection, I want you to, I want you to get this. See, it says it would take, uh, in the uh, commentaries I studied, it would take eight strong men to move this tomb. Did you notice in the thing it was kind of on a hill and that's how they do it? They rolled it? You ain't unrolling it without eight men. And who showed up? A lady. A lady in her grief who said, I would rather have a dead Jesus near me than not have no Jesus and she didn't care what it was I got just to get to Jesus. And I sense that some of you guys are here like, I just need Jesus. See, the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out, my friends. The stone was rolled away so we can get in. Because then we can experience the resurrection power of Jesus. See, no tomb could hold him, no walls could contain him, but what he needed for us to get in so that we would believe and we would experience that resurrection life. And even though you do not understand the scriptures and all that I'm saying, I'm telling you, the power is there for you. That he is saying it is time to move the stones of impossibility. Amen? And what I love is that it says... In Romans 6, now if we died with Christ, we also believe that we will live with Christ. And then it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone, which I love is anyone in the Greek means anyone, male, female, child, elderly, doesn't matter what ethnicity you are, anyone is in Christ is a new creation. I want you to picture your old life like that tomb, taking Jesus off, wrapping you up, and when you experience the resurrection power, you come out as a new person. And that's what happens at baptism. You become a new person. And you might not always feel that way, and that old stuff has to still be put to death, but positionally, you are a new person in Christ. And then one of my all-time favorite passages, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I choose. See, Satan ripped Jesus' beard out and Jesus let him. Satan whipped Jesus' back. Or did I said it. Satan whipped Jesus' back and Jesus let him. Satan mocked Jesus and Jesus let him. And Satan took Jesus to the cross, and Jesus led him so that we would have life. And so we choose to come to the same cross that Jesus did. We lay it down so that we can experience the resurrected power of Jesus. What I find is so many Christians want this without that. And they don't deny themselves and they pick up the cross. And, and, and we live in a time where people just don't say sin, sin anymore. See, God hated sin so much that he sent his son, but loved us so much that, that, that he would do it. How could someone send their only son to die? Because he loves his children. We are his fruit. And when we dabble in sin and don't take it serious, 
Oh, I know. You're like, oh, I hate when preachers talk like this. I only say that because I want you to be free. He came to set the captives free. Positionally, you are free. The prisoners are free, but you're captive by sin. And he wants you to be free. Amen? And, and what I love is, so Jesus rises from the tomb, and he runs into Mary and, and has his encounter. But then later on down, he uh, runs into the disciples and, and visits them at night. And so this Wednesday, we are down at the chapel. We are doing a worship night. And you're like, ah, oh, great. Um, it is the end of a Jewish holiday called the Tabernacle of Tents. And it's commanded by God to do this. And what it was, it was a feast. And it was, one of the, it was the only one that there was no restrictions on that you just came and ate. And what you would do if you were a good Jewish family, you would set up a tabernacle, or a tent on your roof, or you'd go outside the city, and you would set it, and you would have no uh, covering on it, and you would look to the stars, and you would give thanks to all the things that God has done, and it was seven days. And, and the reason that God commanded his people to do this, it says in Leviticus 23, the he commanded his people to do it. It wasn't for you. It wasn't for you. It's for him. It's for him. It's to remind you of all the great things that he has done for you. See, a lot of times we Christians, we get together and we complain all the bad things. And he just says, I want you to take a week out to talk about all the good things. And so this Wednesday night at 630 in the back of the chapel, we are having a worship under the stars. And it's supposed to be beautiful outside. And, and I, I say this part. I've been in this church for over 20 some years. And I've seen God move in this church in powerful, powerful ways. I was part of this church when we were on North Avenue in a, in a car lot. And we dreamed about what would it look like for a church to have thousands, to be the church to the unchurched. And this little church believing that we could have thousands of people come to know Christ. I, I've been part of this church that has seen cell group leaders be transformed to transform people. I've seen this church rise up with, with Pastor Kirk in and, and, and South Sudan. and Tens and tens of thousands of people come to know Jesus. But for me personally, the things that I have seen my very first day of ever being on staff at this church, we were at a uh, staff gathering and uh, our children's pastor, we were kind of talking about what do we hope God's going to do? 2003. What do we hope God's going to do? Some of you guys weren't even around 2003. Okay. And, and, and some people are saying, oh, I want this, I want that. But Marilyn, she gets up on the board and, and she writes... I want a camp. Everybody's like, oh, that would be great. And, and, and then she says, it needs to hold 100 kids. It's like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. And then she says, it needs to be within 100 miles. And everybody's like, oh, right? And then the last phrase that she put on it, and it needs to be free. And I'm telling you, people started laughing. How are you going to get a camp that holds 100 people and that's free. And some people are like, oh, maybe we could pretend. And, then, and so we prayed. And I'm saying, we didn't pray with faith. We just prayed. Five years, almost to the day, I get a phone call from Camp Kiwanis saying, hey, Bob, would you like a camp? And I'm thinking, now let me look at my wallet. I have no money. No. And he says, no, no, I want to give you a camp. And guess how many people that camp holds? 100. Guess it's within 100 miles. And guess the price? It is free. That, that God hears the cries of his people when they pray. And so I'm telling you, I believe, and I don't say this lightly, I believe this Wednesday at 6.30 in the back of the chapel, will be one of the greatest days this church has ever seen. 
And I've seen thousands fed. I've seen food multiply. I've seen a person get out of their wheelchair. I've seen the blind see. I have seen. But I believe this is going to be one of the greatest days. And God is going to download something into us that we have been so hungry for. It's going to be like fresh manna. And I encourage you to come. I encourage you to invite your friends. Because it's going to be one of those things. Were you there the day that Marilyn wrote on the board? Or were you there when you just heard about it? Do you want to hear about it? Or do you want to experience it? Now, see, I I get nervous even saying these kind of things because it's putting a lot of pressure on God to show up, right? But if we have expectations and he shows... And which reminds me, so the lady that was telling you that he covered her head, her name was Glinda. And Glinda I met out at Kimwood um, eight years ago. She has been passed away for the last uh, two years. And Glinda started coming out, and she was a a practicing witch, and she had um, really struggled with alcohol, and she couldn't quit drinking. And every time we saw Glinda, she was drunk. And, but her daughter came out, her daughter Jasmine, and her daughter Jasmine would come out and she would sit under Sunday school and and start learning. Her daughter was eight years old. And uh, it just so happened that we uh, had got that camp. And it so happens that Jasmine went to this camp, it's now called Camp Hope, for kids who were underprivileged that would never get to hear the gospel. And it just so happens that she went up there and Glinda went with her to that and saw her daughter, who is eight years old, give her life to Jesus and get baptized. See, Glinda would come out and to the park, and whenever we would sow the seed, the devil would take it. And then what happened with Glinda, when she was 14 years old, Glinda was kicked out by her parents because her dad did things that should never be done to a girl. And so she lived on her own. And you can imagine being a 14-year-old girl in this valley trying to survive what you must do. And so she found a 25-year-old man that was more than happy to take a 14-year-old girl. And they have a child together. And in this wound, her heart became so hard, and the only way that she could cover her heart was drinking. And so every time we saw her, she'd been drinking. And now she's living with this other guy, But she comes out, and she's practicing witchcraft, and she's doing this. And uh, we keep on loving her and sowing seeds. And this guy keeps stealing it, and it keeps falling on hardened ground. But when she saw the transformational power of her daughter and the change in her daughter, she says, the guy she was living with, his name is Robert, says, I can't live like this anymore. And then said, Pastor Bob, will you marry us? And so I said, sure. And, and it was the first wedding we ever had out in the park at Kimwood. And I'm like, it was one of those weddings I'll never forget. She showed up drunk. It sounds like a country western song. She was wearing raider colors. Her dress was silver and black. And uh, the best man had a cigarette in his hand and a beer in his other hand. And he had to hand it to the groom as he got the ring out. And I was like, oh, man, I was so religious, so judging them. Like, where is God in all this? I'm like, I didn't realize it until just now. I think my heart was hardened to what God was doing. But I go through this process, and I just think, this is silly. But a week later, she comes up to me and says, I can't keep drinking like this. Will you pray for me? See, so think the seed was planted, but it was being choked out. And so we prayed. And, you know, I'd love to say it was one of those, like, I felt fire come out, and I, name of Jesus, and she dropped, and she got up. I'm like, no, it was one of those praying for the camp. It could happen, but most likely it won't. God even honors those prayers sometimes. And so she stopped drinking for one day. And it was a, it was a struggle. In two days, and two days turned to three days, and then I saw her on Sunday, and it became one week. And then the next, it was two weeks. And she struggled, 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 and three weeks. And then on the year anniversary, she came and she shared what God had done for her. See, God started to remove some of the weeds. And then, but 
the gospel, the, the, God's word will not be mocked. What you reap, you will sow. And so she spent a big chunk of her life drinking. She was only 30, and she developed liver disease. And in this liver disease, she began to wither away. And as she began to wither away, uh, she got very sick, and we visited the hospital and prayed, 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 prayed. And uh, eventually, she had to go to hospice. And she was out at our park um, a couple weeks before she passed away. And, and Sue was talking to her. She was still staying far away from us. She would talk to us, but when the service was going, she was far away. And Sue went up to her and just started talking to her, like, do you know Jesus? Like, I know God, and do you know Jesus? Well, I believe in a power. Do you know Jesus? And, and it so reminds me, this morning I was praying about it. Okay, how many of you guys grew up in the 70s and kind of know what I'm talking about? If you don't know, kung fu movies. Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, David Carradine, kung fu. This is what it was like with Sue and Glenda. Sue would change, wah, wah and they're blocking shots, and, and uh, you know, Sue would share something, and she would say, block it, block it, block it, and ah, wah, and I was just like, and this isn't going nowhere. And finally, Sue just, you, know, you ever see the old Bruce Lee where he punches the guy in the heart and, and pulls it out and shows it to him in front of him? I can see some of you guys smiling, like, oh, yeah, that was cool. And I'm telling you, in the 70s, this was cool. It was really cheesy. But that's what Sue did. She said, what will happen to you when you die? pulled out a heart and held it. And the moment the guy sees his heart, he dies. He's like, oh, oh. <laughs> and that moment, she accepted Jesus. That, that inner life. And then she went to hospice, and she went for two more weeks. And she came out. She used to be uh, probably like a size 14, uh, beautiful lady. But she came to us, if anybody's walked through this process of death, she came to us like a size three, just all withered and yellow. And she was in a wheelchair, and she had her friend sneak her out of hospice and brought her to the park, and she sat in the very front with her hands raised as we sang Amazing Grace. Oh, what a wretch like me that could be saved. And, and that's the gospel. And so Jesus, on that day, the first, even the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said to them, peace be with you. See, sometimes we lock ourselves up and Jesus isn't intimidated by walls that we put up or doors we put up. Jesus wants in. And Jesus is speaking to some of your hearts right now and he is, pow, pulling your heart out right now and you can feel it. And he's saying, it's time to do business with me. And he says, peace be with you. I love how he says, are you guys so stupid you don't remember what I said? He just says, peace, because he knows they're full of fear. And he said, and he showed them his hands and his sides, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. This week I was reading a story about this mom. This was in May, and her son was in Afghanistan, and her son's tank was hit. And, and they reported five of the lives were lost in this, this attack. And the commander called the mother back in the States and says, we are sorry, but your son Bill died in combat. And the mother is devastated, absolutely devastated. Three days later, the phone rings. And the mom picks up the phone. And she says, hello. And the voice over the phone says, Mom, I'm okay. This is what it was like for these guys. They thought it was hopeless and gone. And Jesus comes in and says, I'm all right. Take a look. I was once dead, and now I live. And because I live, you can live. And then it says, they were glad. Can you imagine the joy the mom had? Hopelessness to pure joy. And then Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. What we need, church, is the breath of Jesus on us to bring us to life. 
He is not afraid to come to walls and speak to us. The tomb is open. He's inviting us in. At this time, I'd like to invite the worship team up. See, a pastor friend, a pastor friend of mine, his best friend has stage four cancer. His best friend uh, is 36 years old and uh, married with two kids. And he had been battling stage four cancer, and uh, it was not looking good. And he was in the hospice at home, and his wife is with him with his two boys, six and four, and his wife and his two boys and his mother and dad and his mother-in-law and his father-in-law are around this bed, this tomb, and he is struggling for his last breath, and the wife calls the pastor and says, my husband's gone home. It's over. And the pastor says, oh, I'm so sorry. And the wife says, why are you sorry? Because he lives. Because he lives. He's more alive now than he was when he was here with his disease. And then she said, it was the most beautiful thing. I held my two boys' hands, and my mother and my father and my father-in-law and my mother-in-law held hands. And we sang this song. And if you've been part of this church or church for any time, you're going to know it right away. And he said, God sent his son. And his name is Jesus. And they sang this over him. For he came to love, heal, and forgive. He, came, he lived and died to buy my pardon, set me free from prison. And an empty grave proves my Savior lives. You can only sing that if you know it is true. You can sing it in church, but can you sing it over your dad? Can you sing that over your husband? Can you sing that over your son to know whatever happens, God is in control? And even though I die, I will live because he lives. And he says, now because I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all my fear is gone. I know he holds the future, and life is worth the living just because he lives. Church, he lives. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And so we are going to stand and sing this last song. I ask you to stand right now. And what I'm asking you to do right now is that there's papers here and on some of these that you need to just do business. Some of you guys need to, to start weeding some stuff out of your life and that's confession, bring it to the cross. And some of you are just so full of, you've been captive by the enemy and fear and anxiety and you just got to say, fear, go. Anxiety, I give to you, Jesus. Sickness and disease, I give to you, Jesus. Hopelessness, I give to you, Jesus. We lay it at the cross today and know that his resurrection power is more than able because it lives in all of us. And so as we sing this last song, I just ask you to do business with God ever how that is. Amen?